Welcome back. It's time to continue on with our lecture for week three. And we left off by talking a lot about Joshua. We're going to pick up with Joshua. And so that's where you should be on your notes. We're talking about Joshua. And the first blank is the man, Joshua. Because when I say that, I'm referring to the fact that later we're going to be talking about the book, Joshua, which is about a lot of Joshua's life. But I want to distinguish, first of all, between the man, Joshua, and the book that bears his name. So the man of Joshua, the man Joshua, he was born in Egypt. So he is a child um, and born into slavery. And then he is one that flees Egypt, crosses the Red Sea, is in the wilderness for the beginning of that journey. And then as young man is chosen as one of the 12 tribes, uh, 12 spies representing each tribe. And he and Caleb are the only ones that come back and say, with the Lord's help, we can defeat this land of giants, if you will. And so he's Egyptian and he's a faithful God. He's Egyptian in the sense of place of birth, but he's Hebrew in identity. And he totally trusts God. And his, his name pronounced more in the Hebrew style, Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. You think of Yahweh or Jehovah, you have Joshua, uh, the J having the Y sound in the Hebrew. Uh, Yeshua, which for Christians is interesting because that is the Hebrew name by which Jesus would have gone. Jesus is more of a Greek version of uh, of the name that was Yeshua, Yeshua. So Jesus would be Yeshua. Um, so Joshua is an actual person in the Old Testament, but also a foreshadowing of Jesus, particularly given the fact that his name means the Lord saves. Uh, it is means the Lord is salvation. A blank there. Name means Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. He is, according to chapter 13, one of the tribes that I said uh, sent in and gives the minority report that says, let's go, and uh, gets turned down. So he is commissioned by Yahweh. He's commissioned by God to be Moses' replacement. Moses doesn't just on his own say, I think I'll pick Joshua, nor does it go up to vote uh, among the people. He is one of the obvious choices. It looks like it would be Joshua or Caleb, but according to God, it needed to be Joshua. There are many ways in which Joseph, Joseph is the new, uh, or Joshua rather. Joshua is the new Moses. That's a blank there. Joshua is the new Moses in the sense that he's a continuation of the old, that he doesn't radically change things, that he just picks up where Moses left off. And this is not an insult. This is actually a compliment. You recall that Moses is considered to be a humble man, is considered to be uh, a righteous man, obviously made mistakes and paid for them. Uh, but overall, he's respected as the author of the law, the great uh, communicator of the law, God being the ultimate author. And he is uh, remembered fondly, even today. And so Joshua being in his footsteps, um, it's a compliment that he, he, he is the new Moses. He, he is the one that is going to lead the people the way that they should be led. Um, and so first thing we see, I'll give you some reasons why he's the new Moses. You can write these down in your notes. Uh, the first is he assumes military leadership that once belonged to Moses. So again, this is not a nation yet. It's not ruled by any man it's ruled by god and the priest and the holy people the spiritual leadership if you will uh is is there through aaron and moses and the judges that he's appointed thanks to his father -in law father-in-law jethro's advice but he is not saying that because it's spiritual leadership that there is no government-like activity. And so they have law and law and order. And often to keep law and order, uh, you need military. 
and this is where the military comes into play here in this story. And whereas Moses was not known for getting down there and fighting more, raising his hand as a symbol of God's divine presence, Joshua uh, takes that role. He is going to be the great commander in chief of God's army. Another thing we see that just makes him new Moses, he completes Moses' work. Moses' main task was to help God's people be set for, set free from Egypt and go into the promised land. And he does all that up to viewing the promised land, but does not take the people into the promised land. So Joshua is going to complete that task. He's going to finish the job. He's going to finish the race. Another thing that we see that's really interesting, as you recall, Moses takes the one and a half to two million people and they cross the red or the Reed Sea, some body of water in that North African region, heading up towards Middle East. And they cross as a miracle of God. They cross on dry ground. The Lord splits the seas. Well, symbolically and literally, but it's symbolic that he is the new Moses because you see that he also has his own sea crossing. But in this case, the sea is a river. And he takes the people, the women and children, and the next generation of men, uh, across the Jordan River. Very similar story. And the people go across on dry ground. So when you think river, don't think a creek, don't think a small river. Uh, think of a massive river, maybe a, a Kenai and larger river. And they go across this, not by bridge and not by stepping on rocks, but across dry ground. And so this is one way of affirming Joshua, God saying to Joshua, I trust you. And God saying to the people, uh, this Joshua is leading you uh, faithfully, just as Moses did. Uh, we also see in chapters three and four, um, some testament to Joshua. And we can see this as an, another aspect of Joshua being the new Moses. Um, found here in the book of Joshua. Let me backtrack there a little bit and tell you, as we've talked about with the books of the law, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, and now we're out of that and we're going in to the historical document uh, known as Joshua. And there is a aspect of this historical writing, this, this historical writing, not necessarily law, but just telling the story. There's law in it, but it's not considered the law of Moses. This is now past Moses. So the book of Joshua is a great historical moment recorded. In, in chapter 3 and chapter 4, we're going to see uh, some Joshua, Moses-like events. One, as I mentioned, is the crossing of the Jordan. And verse 5 of chapter 3, Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. And Joshua hears from the Lord. Verse 7, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of the Israelites, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. So Moses is mentioned here to Joshua. And he's clearly told by God that he's going to be blessed just like Moses was. And in, in chapter 4, we see more of this. And so he commands them to come up out of the Jordan. And in verse 18 of chapter 4, the priest came up out of the water carrying the river, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran to flood stage as before. So the idea earlier in the story, as you heard me say, God says, tell your priest to go right to the water and go into the river. And at this point, the river parts. And the Ark of the Covenant, that symbol of God's presence, is now because the priests have journeyed 
on the other side of the river. And as soon as their feet come out of there, the, uh, the waters come back. And so here again, Joshua is being shown to be a man of power and a man after God. Another thing we see in chapter five um, is that Joshua removes his shoes in the presence of God. In chapter five, verse 15, um, it says this, the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This is important because you may recall that that's what Moses was called to do at the burning bush. You're on holy ground and uh, so take your shoes off. And so there's this other event that's very much like that. Um, he also, like Moses, intercedes for the nation. So not, is he, not only is he a military leader, uh, but he, he's a priest in the sense that he's praying for his people. Another thing is he leads the nation in the observance of the Passover. So Moses instituted it under God's guidance, and now Joshua leads the people in the Passover. Another is they both, they both make provisions for the allotment of land, whereas Moses, while they're in the wilderness, said, you, you go in this area, and you go in this area, and you, you go in this area temporarily because they're still nomadic. Joshua is now going to say, okay, tribe, you go here, you go here. It took a more permanent placement to a place where they will live because they're no longer going to be nomadic, at least in the short term. And then uh, another example is of the new Moses is the um, act of circumcision as recorded uh, in the text. Now, one of the things that is important to notice, uh, given the fact that they've been wandering in the wilderness, is that there has not been circumcision done. Remember, the first generation died off, and now these young uh, boys have become young men and warriors, and uh, there has not been um, circumcision that is taking place uh, while they're wandering in the wilderness. And so throughout these chapters, uh, throughout the book, you have the land described uh, where they're going to be, uh, he tells them to, to keep that. And so it's important to know that as they are doing this, as they're finding their land, they are being told, you need to be faithful to God. And the main sign that they need to be faithful to God is this covenant relationship. And you recall that a covenant relationship was marked literally uh, by the circumcision of the male. And so these men now are being circumcised, uh, not as young boys, because that's when they're in the wilderness. And so just as Moses carrying on the tradition from Abraham, Moses instructed uh, circumcision. Now Joshua does as well. So that's a lot about the man, Joshua. Now let's talk about the book, Joshua, of which, in which Joshua has talked a lot about the man. But let's talk about the book now. Uh, basically, the book picks right up where Deuteronomy left off. Uh, the Israelites are encamped on the plains of Moab, and they're waiting the Lord's command to go over. And that's kind of the beginning of the story. And there are five motifs that the book carries throughout. Five motifs or themes, five major motifs of the book of Joshua. And the first one is holy war. I'm going to talk more about that, uh, but right now, I just want you to realize that what we're talking about is a war considered holy. Remember, a little bit ago, we were talking about the rules of war. Well, here is the idea that there can be such thing as a holy war. In our nation and other nations, we, we talk about um, are the military engagements in which we're involved uh, called for? Are they... Um, acceptable? Are they necessary? Um, biblical version of that would be, are they holy? Is this a, is this a God honoring battle? Now, ultimately, if you go back all the way back to the book of Genesis uh, 1 and 2, God creates a very peaceful environment. There's no war. But then Genesis 3 um, is the total uh, reverse of that where humanity 
accepting the lies of Satan welcomes uh, welcomes them in. And uh, you might be interested, uh, you know, I've not mentioned this before, uh, that that this is um, the book. The book I've written on it, Genesis Three World, talks all about this. Like why why there is brokenness. Why or what are the results we see in the world because of it? And one of the results we see of it is war and quickly fills up the pages of the Old Testament. So just backing up, we, we're not saying God designed war as a thing that was necessary. What we see is that once sin into the sin entered the world, people begin to be more greedy and more selfish and obstinate and began to debate. I mean, brother killed brother and people fought over land. And so uh, war has been a reality for God's people and all peoples uh, since Cain killed Abel. Um, and God is not pro-war in the sense of he desires war, but he understands uh, that war is a reality of civilization now. And so what God does with that is he says there's rules to this and we have this judgment system, this grading system of is this done well or is it not done well? Is it done in a holy way or not a holy way? And you see examples of the Old Testament of both. You see God saying to them, we'll go in and uh, offer them peace. And if they don't take peace, go in and destroy the land. In some cases where the enemy is just in occupying the land, he tells them to go and have a battle. And then if they surrender, then uh, just bring them in as servants and let them live at peace. There are other times in cultures that were more perverse, or had religious practices that were extreme, such as child sacrifice um, and great cruelty, if God would say to them, I want you to go in and wipe out every living creature, man, woman, child, uh, animal, a little bit. And that seems very brutal to us, but those are extreme examples. Um, and if you read the Old Testament carefully, you see that that was the exception, a real exception, but it was there. Um, and the rest of the time, there were more rules. But all that to say that one of the themes you see in Joshua is that the wars that they are fighting as they're taking over almost all of the Holy Land, the land flowing with milk and honey, the land of the Moabites, Canaanites, etc. Um, those are holy efforts. Those are God-sanctioned wars. First theme or motif. Second theme or motif is the land the promises, land, people. And now we're seeing they're actually in the land. The people are there. Now the people are going into the land. Abraham's promise is now being fulfilled. The third theme is the unity of Israel. The unity of Israel. And you see the addressing of the people as, quote, all Israel. There's a unified nation. So, for example, we are in the midst of a year that, as you're well aware, in November, there's going to be a big election uh, where our president will be chosen for the next four years. And on both sides of the aisle, uh, people say the, the will of the American people or the desire of the American people. Or we want to make the decision on behalf or for the American people. And that doesn't really mean every single person in America. That's a statement that says the general understanding of the American people. Sometimes that's right. Sometimes that's wrong. Well, I just want you to hear that language. When you think about all Israel, what the author is saying here is that there's great unity in Israel and they're thinking alike. Now, that's not 100% across the board. They're still saying there's still selfishness, there's dispute. Thus, the law still needs to be enforced. But the idea that they are all Israel, they're not a divided people. And this is a fresh moment in their lives. Think about it. They're now into their own land. And there's something about moving into a new house and they're unified and it's fun. It's a new experience. And the family's all unified about it as long as everybody's got the right room and they can pick their paint or whatever. This is where they are. Um, and nobody's messing with each other's land right now. It's okay. You go here, you go here. And war was a unifier actually because they're fighting a common battle. And so there's this unity. The, the fourth is the the role of Joshua. We've already talked about this, but that's a motif of the book that repeatedly you're going to see 
the role of Joshua. And again, that is much like Moses. And then the fifth theme is the covenant. It keeps bringing back this idea of covenant, this promise, this idea that God is always the keeper of his covenant. And now the people are acting covenantally. They are faithful. There's been a lot of unfaithfulness throughout the lands of Egypt for 40 years, a land of wilderness outside of Egypt. And now, um, after the war, the great wars of conquering different towns, uh, they go into land, and, and there's great peace based upon the covenant. And I want to talk to you about some of the contents now. Those are the motifs, the big motifs, holy war, land, unity of Israel, the role of Joshua, and the covenant. Now let's think about the, the content of the book itself. Uh, some people have called Joshua the literary bridge, the literary as in written, the written bridge or literary abridged bridge between the wilderness experience and the narrative of the struggles in the early years of occupying the land. And that's going to be later articulated in Judges, the book of Judges. And so there's a not only is it placed within the, the canon of scripture between the books of Moses and the book of Judges, but it's also there because it's this literature that gaps, that fills in the gap, that it's a transitional period. And thankfully, once you get past the wars, the early pages of it, uh, it's actually a place of, of great peace and unity, as I said before. There are two main parts, uh, each approximately half of the book. And the first one is this rapid survey of the conquest of the land, They're basically explaining uh, how the land was taken and who, who gets what um, in anticipation of that, which leads to the second part of the book, in essence, about the second half roughly, is the description of how the land was actually divided. Uh, so in the part one, the war, uh, the, the fall of Jericho and all the other falls and uh what God's plan is, second half of the book, here's how it's actually distributed to the 12 tribes uh, and then how Levi fits into that as a 13th tribe. So here's an outline. Uh, chapters 1 through 12, military conquest. Chapters 13 through 22, achievement of what was promised for the people, the stability of being in the land. And chapter 23 and 24, the renewal of Israel's ancient covenant with God. It's deeply embedded in this passage is the idea of righteousness and holiness and God's graciousness. One of the first obstacles of the, them is the Jericho, which is why Joshua fought the battle of Jericho is such a famous little kid tune in church. Uh, that's the most famous battle because it's the most major conflict early on. There also is going to be um, some reference to the results of disobedience, because while it is a story of more obedience than previous, um, there is some disobedience. One author put it this way, uh, that they have a coalition um, with the Gibeonite cities that make a, a deal with folks that they should have driven out. Um, they have this north to south route uh, that would become a factor in the disunifying of the land. In other words, because you didn't fully follow God, there's later going to be disunity here. So let's talk about the authorship and date of the book of Joshua. We refer to the fact that it's about Joshua, but who wrote it and when did they write it? It's translated into that, but to this day, in other words, when it's written, um, it's talking about the time the author saying to this day, a day past these events. So still to this day is another way to think of that. It clearly suggests a later time. So if I were to say, uh, till this day, uh, Rabbit Creek Church has a men's group that meets on Wednesdays. That wouldn't mean much to you, but I could go on and tell you that there's a men's group that I'm a part of on Wednesday mornings that has been going on for over 20 years. I've been a part of that for almost 16, but it's predated me. So if I say, um, since that day, I'm I'm telling you I'm after that day. I'm not there from the beginning. 
uh, the author of this book is saying since that day, since back then, it clearly suggests a later time, but not much later uh, than the events itself. It seems the work consists of the oral and written tradition from the time of Moses. So some dates to, to give you some ballpark here. Uh, the invasion of Canaan would have taken place around 1400 BC. Some say 1250, but for our, our cases, we'd say around 1400 BC, about 1400 years before the birth of Jesus. And the date of the Exodus would have been about 46 years prior to that. Um, and so we know it's written after uh, 1400 BC. We don't know how far after. So that's the theme of Joshua. Uh, now let's talk about the promised land. That's the next blank. And then under the next blank, uh, the promised land equals the area of Palestine. Palestine, P-A-L-E-S-T-I-N-E. -E. Now you recognize that term because it's one in our media all the time now. There is a ongoing war between the nation of Israel and the Palestinian territory but it's technically not against the Palestinian government. It is against Hamas, which is a radical Islamic group within the territory of Palestine. And Palestine and Israel, the land given to the Israelis after World War II, they butt up against each other. And this is where you have the Gaza Strip. This is where you have the great tension that's going on. Um, all the time, basically, between these two cultures. Um, from a Christian standpoint, you have Christianity uh, actually in greater number in the land of Palestine because the majority of people in Israel who are people of faith are Jewish, which would be pretty obvious. And so we tend to think in, in uh, very uh, black and white terms in our nation that you know Israel's bad, Israel's good, Palestine's bad. That's the way a lot of Americans think. Uh, but that's too simplistic of a view. Uh, that has more to do with allies and this sort of thing. Um, but what we're talking about in Palestine in this day, in the Old Testament day, what we're saying is not the same thing as the Palestine. We would be talking about the whole thing. So now, map and the east side of the Mediterranean, Israel, and then around that you see Syria and Palestine and these areas. This whole area, now called Israel, would all have been Palestine. So this is the land of Palestine. This is where everybody would have, regardless of faith and background, would be Palestinian. The, the, the Jewish people are now going to become Palestinian by being in that territory. So there may be a little confusion, but I want to make sure when we're saying Palestine is the Holy Land, we're not saying just what's left of it today. We're talking about even all that's called Israel today. It's all one big area. And so there's this picture of the conquest as recorded in the book of Joshua, and it's idealized in some way because they actually don't take the whole land. Um, they pretty much take the hill country, and there are parts they don't take. But it's told in a way that is accurate um, but idealized in a bit. Um, just as uh, we, we might be talking about a sporting event of a, of a championship team and, uh, and talk about how great they were and all these wins they had. They might have had loss. We don't talk about it uh, if we're not being specific. And so that's a silly analogy, but it gets you close to it. Um, and there is a conquest of a land. And this is about the completion of a covenant. That's what it's about. It's not about, in essence, I mean, in reality, it's not just we want to take some land that doesn't belong to us. It's a promise to have kept a covenant that God made with Abraham. He says, your people, you remember this all the way back in Genesis, your people will be enslaved, but they will be set free and they will go into the land that I promised your descendants. And now they're there. Now, a key player in this story, which is found in chapter two, who is found in chapter two, 
is a woman named Rahab. And Rahab, R-A-H-A-B, is mentioned also in Matthew chapter, or excuse me, Hebrews 11, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 11. And this is the faith chapter, people call it. It talks about all these people of great faith. And Rahab was from Jericho. She was not an Israeli. She was not an Israelite, rather. She was not a person of Hebrew faith. She did not worship Yahweh. Um, and in fact, she was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. And you can go back and read the story. When the, when the spies go, um, obviously a prostitute's dwelling would have been a place that uh, men were uh, often frequenting. So for men to go there was not unheard of. And so what the spies did, um, Hebrew spies, they went to her. They wouldn't be suspect. They'd just be, oh, they and do. And this is where they find a safe haven. And they make a covenant with Rahab. He says, well, tell you what, um, our God is about to take down this, this whole town. And because of your love, because of your graciousness for us, um, you can bring all your family in here and you're going to hang uh, a ribbon basically outside the door, outside the window, the wall. And that's going to identify for the people that this is a safe haven. This is the place do, you do not attack. And so of all the people of Jericho, it's only Rahab and her family uh, that are spared. And so she survives, as does her family. And she's going to play in. Uh, her story is going to be a key part of what is going to ultimately lead to Jesus. And so it's fascinating to see that this woman who is, even though we saw in the law, they're not to marry outside their people because of religious reasons. Um, that here is an example where God uses the, the unsuspecting uh, that we wouldn't expect and they wouldn't expect uh, God used. And uh, so we'll, we'll go back and say that story. It's a pretty great story about God's redemptive plan through a woman named Rahab. Um, I want to talk about the miracles that we find in the book of Joshua, basically three that we want to talk about. And before we do that, I want to talk about a miracle. What are we talking about? We're talking about a miracle. We're talking about an event that cannot be explained naturally. And a miracle, by definition, is supernatural. Now, that doesn't mean it can't take place within the natural. So we talked about this with the plagues back in Egypt, where there were locusts and there were gnats and there were flies. Uh, all those things happen on a regular occurring basis, but the magnitude by which, uh, in which they happened, the timing in which it happened, uh, the precise description of how it happened, that this made it miraculous. And so the things that we're going to see, um, the miracle took place because God made it take place. Uh, first one is this idea of the Jordan or this event of the Jordan, the, the crossing of the Jordan River, as I mentioned before, total miracle. Second one is Jericho. Go back and read the story. But in essence, what we have is a, a comical warfare, if, if there's such a thing, uh, because uh, in order for the Jericho's um, strong fortress to be um, destroyed, all it took was a little bit of singing and blowing of the trumpets. Uh, check it out. If you haven't read it, go back and read it. Uh, but it's a miracle because that thing caused some great victory. God's miracle caused great victory. And that's the point is these are God's people. These, these stories keep saying, these are God's people. God is on your side. Now, there's another miracle that's actually received a lot of press, if you will, a lot of attention. Um, because of the scientific connotations, what happened and if it happened exactly the way it states that it happened, uh, what would that have done to the whole way in which our world operates? Um, and this is the story, um, as found in chapter 15, of the sun standing still. Now, you recall um, when they left Egypt, the Hebrew people did, um, God protected them. Um, by a pillar of fire at night and cloud by the day. So God provides these things within nature to guide the people. Um, warfare, long before night vision goggles, um, 
was take what took place in the daytime. And so the story there um, in Joshua chapter 15 is one of the sun standing still. A uh, miracle, of course. The question about the miracle is what actually happened? Is it the fact that the sun actually stood still? Because by modern scientific understanding of that, they didn't understand at that point. God hadn't let, revealed that to them. Um, they thought of the sun as moving and therefore the earth stays still and the sun uh, moves. Their understanding of how the earth operated, how the cosmos operated. Uh, we know now that the sun actually does stand still and the earth and the planets, planetary system go around the sun, rotate around the sun. So first of all, when it says the sun stood still, um, what that would essence mean, if we take it 100% literal, is the earth stood still, because the sun is still. And so the earth stood still. Now, if the earth stood still, you've got some issues on your hands because it stops rotating and you have weather patterns messed up. You have total devastation, basically, if that world is not perfectly spinning on its axis as God created it to do. If everything doesn't operate in the way in which we've measured the 24 hour period, uh, then you have some chaos on this globe. So we know for sure the sun was already standing still. The miracle that wasn't that the sun stood still because it already is still, but that was their perception of it. So what are we talking about? Well, uh, some believe that Joshua was asking for relief from the sun's heat. Um, others that the rays of the sun and the moon were bent by alteration of refracting power of the atmosphere, so the sun and moon appeared to stand still. Whatever happened, and something must have occurred. The faith of the Israelites was greatly strengthened thereby. So, what they're saying is, we don't know. We just know that there was great faith because of it. Um, there's a uh, passage, uh, I understand it may have been poetic in the passage, in types of literature discussion. Is it poetry fit within a historical account? Interesting enough, the verb, be still, when Joshua says, be still, the, the sun be still, as we say in English, it can mean either remain motionless or be quiet. So what was actually said, we don't know. But we do need to know that we, we grapple with this. And some people look at, Old Testament history as a whole, and come across, come across passages like this, and there's basically two polar opposite responses. One is, it happened, and I don't know how to explain it scientifically, but the earth stood still. God somehow protected it. Um, the other side is, well, it's just a story, and um, there's no way that happened. What Old Testament history teaches us is that we can study it by the historical context of, in this case, people that didn't know that the sun stood still already. We can also know that they're trying to tell a story in a way that we can understand it, even if it didn't quite fully make sense to them. Um, but the point being, back to the paragraph we read earlier, that something obviously took place and they were greatly strengthened because of it, including the power of the uh, covenant of God and the strength of God. Another thing you see in this is uh, for next subject, next blank, the covenant, I keep saying that word, it can be important all the way through, but the covenant renewal. And it's interesting, this took place on Mount Ebal, E-B-A-L, and this is a theme you're going to see throughout scripture so often when it's on a mountain, a mountaintop, a hilltop, it's a place of significance. So just as Moses went to Mount Sinai, Joshua had his Mount Ebal, and the covenant is renewed. I told you earlier I was going to talk a little bit about the holy war idea, and uh, so I do I do want to I do want to do that. Um, and as we do, um, I want to again talk about Palestine because. That is where the war is taking place, the area of Palestine. So one of the old textbooks for this class um, 
it was uh, called the Learning Bible. That's not in print anymore because um, it was in the former translation of the NIV, which isn't published anymore, NIV 1984. So we went on to this new textbook. But I've kept some old notes from the previous textbook because they're helpful. And this says this, Palestine refers to the area of land along the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea from Gaza in the south to southern Lebanon, then east to the areas bordering the Jordan River. It's also known as the land of Canaan or the Holy Land. In the Bible is known as the land of flowing with milk and honey or as the promised land because God promised to give the land to Abraham and his descendants. The region of Palestine was originally called Canaan, and the people who lived there before the Israelites were called Canaanites. It came to be known as Israel after the 12 tribes conquered the land. The region came to be known as Palestine in the time when the Greeks ruled the region beginning in 30, 333 BC. They wouldn't even call Palestine until much later. The name Palestine comes from the Philistines, the name of the people who settled in the narrow strip of land along the southwestern part of the Mediterranean coastline sometime after 1200 BC. Today, Palestine refers to the area covered by Israel, Gaza, and Jordan. And from tip to south, about 150 miles. Uh, so interesting understanding of it. Um, so you get an idea of where we're talking about. And you get the idea that modern peoples are still dealing with the same land. Um, the Holy Land trip that uh, my wife and I led to uh, that area of, of, the, of the world uh, last summer. Our guide was a Palestinian Christian who uh, actually was born in Bethlehem, a birthplace of Jesus. And so we were talking to uh, Rami, which is his name, and he talked about that they who have been there for generations and generations um, refer to themselves as descendants of the ancient Canaanites, people that were on the land before Israel got there. Uh, and so, in essence, I, I talked to a person who's Canaanite. Now, how far back we can actually trace the bloodline, we don't know, but that's how they think of themselves as many of the Palestinians today think of themselves as descendants of the Canaanites, the original peoples. So think about Alaska. You have people think of themselves as the original peoples of Alaska. Um, and there's and there's great pride in that. There's great um, ideas of my people were in this land first uh, mentality. Uh, that's very similar to that area. Uh, I grew up in Texas, and there's bumper stickers, native Texan. There's something people wherever, wherever you are. There's just like we were here first mentality, um, and uh, and, the, and that can be a promising thing and, a, and a, an actual thing. In some places, it's a made up thing, but. In this case that I'm talking about here, uh, the Palestinians, if they've been there generation after generation after generation, uh, they actually would be descendants of the Canaanites. Uh, and that's the same land, Can Canaan land and Palestinian land. Uh, so now let's talk about the Holy War that took place in there. I mentioned it before, but how do we know that it's a holy war? With our morals and ethics, uh, of God in regard to the Holy War. Uh, wars that are allowed because of the sinfulness in the world. Um, there's ideas that people have. These aren't all taking place at the same time because these are various ideas. Some can overlap and some can't. The first one is God can do whatever he wants. Uh, that is true in the sense of his sovereignty. The problem with that statement is there's actually things God cannot do. Now, before you think I'm heretical, what we mean by that is God cannot be inconsistent with who he is. God, for example, is a God of perfect justice. So if he's unjust ever, uh, then he is not just. So therefore, God cannot be unjust. Uh, God also, refer, the Bible refers to God as love. Therefore, God cannot be unloving. Now, we look at God and we see his judgment and we see his love. And sometimes we think, that's not fair or that's not loving, but God gets to define that. And so if we're saying God can do whatever he wants and we mean God is sovereign, then we're saying something's correct. If we're saying God can do anything he wants and therefore somehow excusing God, uh, somewhat like a parent who's going beyond what is appropriate 
as far as discipline of their kid. Like, well, I'm your dad. I can do whatever I want. Well, maybe in theory, but you're going to be a cruel dad if you do that. Um, God's never cruel, but he is just. And that's where that comes in to play with this holy war idea. Uh, second way to explain about the holy war and ethics of God is not God can do whatever he wants. Um, but some people say events happened and people went back and attributed, attributed them to God. So these people look at scripture and say, well, it says God told them to do such and so. God told them to go and walk around Jericho and the walls fall down. God told them to go to Canaan and wipe out the people. Um, they would say, well, that's reflecting back. In other words, their descendants wrote the story about what happened and then said, well, God told us to do that because that was their understanding. They say, well, God didn't, the people that hold this view say, God didn't actually tell them to do that. It's just what happened. And they go back and say, well, God told us to do that. Um, that's a little bit too low a view of the, the scripture. Uh, number three, some say it's it's a total creation. Um, in other words, fabrication, make-believe. Stuff didn't happen. That's one another view. Another view, which I think is the healthiest view. If you have a high view of scripture, you want to be faithful to the, the truthfulness of scripture excuse me, of, of the scripture, but also don't want to just blindly say, well, God can do whatever he wants to do, um, is an idea called God's accommodation. God accommodating. Going back to Genesis, the world. God created the world. He created people. He gave people free will so that they could love him. Love requires free will. If I'm made to love somebody, I'm not doing it because I choose to do so. So God creates free will. People in their free will choose sin, and the results begin to happen. Chain reaction. Brother kills brother. Uh, there's shame between the first couple. And there's disunity among civilizations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So God accommodates. In other words, I'm still a God of love. I'm still a sovereign God. Uh, I'm still in control. But since there's sin in the world, and since there's deception in the world, and since there's brokenness in the world, and since I made a promise to Abraham of land and people, I'm going to accommodate. In other words, I'm going to allow this war to happen so that the promise is fulfilled. I'm going to allow death and destruction to be a scenario, and it would never have happened if sin weren't in the world. You have allowed sin into the world. He would be speaking to humans here. And therefore, I'm accommodating to that. So that's a good explanation, uh, maybe not perfect explanation, but a good explanation of those uh, four, four choices. Again, um, one idea that um, God can do whatever he wants. The other one is that um, they just went back and attributed things to God that he didn't tell them to do. Third, total fabrication. But fourth, God's accommodation. This is reality and God allowed it to happen. Um, so people, Ask a question. It's an important question to ask. It deserves an answer. Can God ask to kill? So, back in Genesis, um, God creates life. Uh, and the first person to take life, the human life, that is, is another man. Brother kills brother. So, the Ten Commandments in Exodus, also recorded in Deuteronomy, um, say that uh, you shall not murder. Uh, some people translate that kill. The accurate understanding is murder, uh, take without cause. But still we wonder, okay, why could God ask to kill? Well, there's some explanations here. Um, one is the Canaanites were descendants. So the, the people that were in the late place later known as Palestine were the Canaanites. And they were descendants of the Amorites. Now, you may not recall this, but all the way back in Genesis 15, when God is talking to Moses about the covenant, he tells him what he's going to do. He gives Moses a heads up about, or excuse me, Abraham a, a heads up about way in the future. This is chapter 15, verse 12. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. 
Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, that's Egypt. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Um, goes on and talk about different people groups, etc. But the phrase in verse 16, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Way before the Exodus even occurred, way before they were even slaves, 400 years before the Exodus, uh, you have God saying, there's a sin among the Amorites and it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and hasn't reached its full measure. In his all-knowing ability, he knows it's going to happen. And the Canaanites are descendants of the Amorites. So one idea here is that God was asking the people, instructing the people rather, to go in and to wipe out these people because the, the sin had reached its ultimate level. It couldn't get any worse, in other words. So we studied the culture that day, and uh, it's a very uh, perverse society and, and a very troubling thing. So that's what, again, every individual, um, but as a whole, the culture, the Canaanite culture within the land of Palestine was polluted. And uh, so God could say, um, because the sin has reached its full measure, referencing back to Genesis 15, it's now time. Another answer to the idea, can God ask to kill, is um, if we take this line of thought, the Amorites were given 400 years to repent. So think about this. If they haven't repented after 400 years, um, then they're probably not going to repent. And so if things have gotten to the epitome of, of unclean and, and, uh, and disregarding of God's laws and holiness, and they've had 400 years to fix this, um, maybe they're never going to do so. Um, and then what we see, with the exception of some of the stories, when you take it as a, as a whole, it is more strategic warfare in the sense that it is more of a judgment than outright slaughter. Now, sometimes it sounds like a slaughter. Go in and wipe out every living creature. There are those moments. We look as a whole, given the offers of peace, the offers of come and be our servants, etc., that it's very strategic in warfare. It's it's not just mass execution, it's warfare, which makes it uh, more holy. Um, in, in Joshua, uh, chapter 24, verse 15, there's a key, key verse. It says, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose yourselves this day whom, whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served, beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in those in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That's Joshua saying to people, you got a choice to make. You can serve God, you can serve these other people. And so he's really calling them back to monotheism. And that's one of the key reasons for these wars is to establish the true identity of monotheism and the one true God. Um, the Harem, H-E-R-E-M, Harem, H-E-R-E-M, is the, the Hebrew word for holy war, which is to, by definition, the killing in the name of Yahweh. So again, probably somewhat of a troubling discussion, but a helpful one as we try to understand the Old Testament. A um, couple other things there. When the Israelites captured Jericho, they burned the city, um, and they did that without killing Rahab and her family. Um, and the word for total destruction uh, is harem, which, as I said, we define it as fighting or killing the name of Yahweh. The actual literal definition is devotion. In other words, you're proving your devotion. So the verb is translated utterly destroyed. So we put it all together. Uh, devoted to the Lord for destruction. We're devoting these people to the Lord for destruction. Because we love the Lord, these people need to be destructed. Uh, that is the idea behind that. Um, it's common practice in many ancient uh, Near Eastern peoples uh, to devote persons and possessions and captives to their gods. And God's people are saying, well, there's one true God. And so we're devoting our efforts of 
taking your land from you as an act of worship to our God. Let me read these couple paragraphs here. God's revelation is progressive. He takes his people where they are and leads them step by step until at last they can be where he is. At this point, the Israelites are not ready for such teachings as a sermon on the mount. Quote, love your enemies. If they had been, God would have given them such revelations. In Yahweh's eyes, the Canaanites were exceedingly great sinners who not only committed abominations, but also sought to entice Israel to join them in the religious acts. Yahweh, the Israelites were rem reminded many times, is a holy God. He cannot, because of his holiness, tolerate such abominable practices, especially in the name of serving a deity. The purity of Israelite image must be, uh, Israelite religion must be preserved. And so we see in the Old Testament areas where God says to reach out to Gentiles and the, the, the non-Jewish people, but he did say you need to wipe out the Canaanites. Um, a couple more blanks and then we'll close out this lecture. And this will be the last lecture for week three. So once you're done watching this one, uh, you're done uh, watching videos until we'll meet again on week four. Um, but the achievement of rest Next blank. Achievement of rest. The people now have rest. It's a rich doctrine of future hope and blessing. They've defeated the majority of the armies. Um, and those they haven't, they're leaving them alone in peace. And so the people are very um, much in a, a good spot. They uh, will not experience uh, what we're going to find in the book of Judges later on. They do not experience uh, the, the hurts of the wilderness. Uh, they overcome through victory, and now they live in land of peace. Uh, I want to go to the end of Joshua, um, the book, uh, to to look at how we look at Joshua's last words. What what does he say before he departs to go be with his Lord? Uh, chapter twenty two. To, to back up a little bit, they across the Jordan River, all the tribes, and some of the people were going to have land on the opposite side of the river. That's where they wanted it to give them more space, uh, land with uh, less less neighborhood. Um, and and uh, Joshua made them a deal and said, uh, "You can stay here, uh, but you need to leave your women and children, and your old men and young boys." And all the fighting men, men of fighting age, will come with the rest of the tribes. And once we've all had our land, um, then you can go back to your families. So, in other words, it's not fair to you stay back here and not help your brothers, cousins, etc. Um, win the land for them as well. So now everybody's in their own land, uh, and these guys are like, okay, now we get to go home. And this is chapter twenty-two. Then Joshua summoned, summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have done all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, and you have obeyed me in everything I commanded. For a long time now, to this very day, there's that phrase you mentioned earlier, you have not deserted your fellow Israelites, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. Now the Lord your God has given them rest, as he promised. Return to your homes in the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Then Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their homes. So they go back and go to have their own land and live at peace. It's a beautiful thing. And then in chapter 23 and 24, uh, we see his his final words, and I read from twenty three earlier. We tell him to be strong and uh, be careful to obey the word of the Lord. Uh, they renew the covenant, making sure they stay on task with God. And I want to read beginning in verse nineteen, the final chapter of Joshua twenty four of the book of Joshua. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. 
He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end to you after he has seen, been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said, your witness is against yourself that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord, our God, and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant of the people, and there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it under the oak tree near the high holy place of the Lord. See, he said to the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words of the Lord. The Lord has said to us, it will be a witness against you if you're untrue to God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to his own inheritance. So this symbolic image of this rock saying, every time you go here, you got to remember your promise, this wonderful promise you have made. And this is then the end of the book. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of the inheritance at timnath in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. So this is all of his lifetime. The eyewitnesses and he himself, who knew God's grace and love, served him. And Joseph's bones, all the way back to Exodus, Joseph asked this. And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up out of Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that jo Jacob bought for 100 pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joshua's descendants, Joseph's descendants. And Lazar, son of Aaron, died and was buried in Giba, which has been allotted to his son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. And then that's how it ends. And there is a beautiful ending uh, to the people. Judges 1 verse 1, just a preview where we're headed. Next book, after the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who of us is to go up and fight against the Canaanites? So there's still some Canaanites to take care of. Um, and their great leader is gone. And so that is where we're going to come up with uh, peace is now going to go back to some uh, time of war. Thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time.